The Grow My Cleaning Company podcast helps owners of cleaning companies just like you to grow your company and yourself so you can make more money and finally get the time and money freedom that probably got you into this business. Discover how to automate and create systems that allow you to grow like crazy without losing control. If you dig the show and want to show some love, subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. It really helps. Enjoy the show. All right, question. Based on your growth goals, should you target more of a broad niche, office general, as opposed to very specific like funeral homes? Uh, clarity on this, because in the area, there's 12 to 15 funeral homes in our service area. Great question. So for niches, I want the smallest possible niche I can get that will okay. that will reach my goals. And I, not that you can't do way better than this, but I don't even consider the conversation around niche free if I think until it's, until I think I use 10% as the number. So with funeral homes, if you've got 15, it's like, well, that's one or two, basically 10%. Um, mm -hmm. Is that going to meet my goals? Like, ah, not even close. So that wouldn't be, so when I say small enough is possible, that can still meet your goals, you know, unless those 15 funeral homes are, you know, $200,000 a month each in revenue. You're like, well, that would meet my goal. Like, and I only need one, but even then my goal wouldn't be to be that top heavy with one client right now. They kind of run your whole business. So that's how I, I don't want it to be a gut feeling of like, that feels a little small. I don't like there's, it, I would like this part of the business to be more science than art. So literally just take the people out there, take 10% of it and be like, what's the average client? It doesn't have to meet your goal for the next 10 years, but it should at least meet your goal for next year. And if that'll do it, it's probably big enough. If it's way over, shrink it, right? If you're like, oh my gosh, this is a hundred million dollar, you know, or $27 million of cleaning in this one little niche, like too big. And if you're like, you know, funeral homes, like the whole gosh darn thing might be 300 grand a year in cleaning. It's like, well, 10% of that's only 30 grand. That's yeah, probably maybe a million. I don't know how to do the math, but even so, if even at a million, which would be generous, it's like, well, shoot, if I do okay in this year one, I might only get hundred thousand dollars of growth. Not worth, not worth it to put all that time and money in. Okay, I understand. Yep. So what you're saying is possibly move away from that niche to something else that that fits in with the goals a little better. Is that what I'm hearing? And I put them in my yellow. So when funeral homes call, okay. just like the when like the former clients or former bids that he didn't have any beef with those would still be yellow. Like I'm not saying I won't put, you know, any time or if they call me, I'm not going to be happy to help them. I'm just not going to, my focus is going to be on my dream. Remember. Okay. Okay. That's understood. Cool. And uh, can I ask a second question? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Last thing on that one. The reason we call it the dream 100 is you also want all of them to be worth enough that if you spend 20, 30 grand this year on your dream 100, two, three, you know, a couple grand a month and, hundred hours this year on them and only got three of them or four of them or five of them, you're like, oh, that would be worth it. Right. Like, so you don't want in your dream 100 of eight hundred dollar a month client. I'm not saying you won't take them. Maybe you will, maybe you won't, depending on your minimums, but I'm not going to spend a bunch of money chasing them. Like with Mike, I don't know his average car dealership, but I'll bet you it's at least three grand, maybe closer to five. So if the average is give or take 50 grand a year, um, and the average one stays three years, like, oh, it's 150 grand. If it costs me four thousand dollars to get that guy, am I okay with that? I'm like, yeah, I'm okay with that. So the nice thing about a dream 100 is marketing budget almost becomes irrelevant, right? Like with residential, we got to be a little more, pay a little more attention because average client might be 400 bucks a month, five grand a year. They stay two years, only 10 grand, take away half for cost of goods sold. We got five grand. Will I spend 500 bucks to get that guy? Heck yeah, I will. Will I spend 2000? Not, 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 not likely. <laughs> does that help before we get on to your next question? It does. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Cool. You had a follow yep. Yeah. So my next question would be, uh, the other one that we do a lot of would be schools. And that's been strictly word of mouth just because you serve one well, they talk, maybe a year later you get into another one. Um, if we were to, if we were to shift into that being the niche, how would you, what advice would you give me for, for the different streams of marketing, knowing that there's a process of uh, a, a school board, a superintendent, and then it probably it most likely starts with the head of facilities. So two things. One, my least favorite reason to pick a niche is we've done them before. I shouldn't say least favorite, but it's not my top three. Um, it doesn't mean we would exclude them, certainly, because you've worked with them. But a lot of people go into residential. Um, if you look in the room, 
the majority of commercial clients are residential and residential or are, are sorry the majority of commercial clients are male and the majority of residential owners are female oftentimes that's just because the ladies were like well this is what i'm comfortable with and i'm not saying residential is better or worse than commercial i'm just saying you don't want to go into it because you're comfortable cleaning a house but you're not comfortable cleaning a build a business because that's just such a small you know what i'm saying like well i'm comfortable with schools but i'm not comfortable with car dealerships i'm not pimping car dealerships i'm just saying that doesn't mean schools are a better niche it just you know you can the gap between you getting comfortable with car dealers is much smaller than if you know one happened to be a, an inferior niche so again not saying you shouldn't do schools but the way i would pick is i want people with lots and lots of pain so if the schools the ones i've gotten are just like yeah we put out to bid every five years we don't really give a crap it's neither here nor there we're just kind of looking for the lowest price and don't steal anything but we don't have any thoughts about it that a bad niche if they're like holy heck what i'm looking to hear is this is my least favorite vendor these freaking guys i'm so sick of it they all say they start great and then they get terrible this is the kids or whatever and it's affecting my day-to-day -day life i'm ready to punch somebody that's what i'm looking for in a niche like i use you guys as an example all the time not a ton of money not you guys as humans but as as a industry owners of cleaning companies not a ton of money which ain't great but really nice people that I enjoy, which for me, I put up because that's where I'm at, but it's okay to be like, I'm more for money. I'm more for my own life. There's no right or wrong answer, but you do want to be clear on that. Um, also, you guys have a ton of pain. You're like, I'm really committed to getting out of cleaning and to building something, whatever. So for me, the fact that I like you guys, and again, not you, I do like you personally, but I'm talking about this industry, you know, like car dealers have a lot more money, but their pains in the ass. I wouldn't want to serve them particularly. Um, at this intimate of a level, I'd clean for him, but I'm not gonna I should say I'm not going to coach him. I, I would, I'd be hard pressed. So you guys are a perfect example of, there's not a ton of you, right? If I wanted like real tours, more money, ton of them. I just, you know, for what, maybe they have pain. Maybe they don't, I don't know. I know you guys have pain. I love that. So not that I want you to be in pain, but I love that I can really make a difference in your life. So if I go to the school and they have pain and they're committed and they're passionate, I'll take that over most things right because they certainly have the ability to pay with commercial you never have to work like residential there might be people in trailer parks or apartments or condos or cheap condos that um are passionate but they don't have any money you know if you're commercial pretty much everyone needs it so we'll talk about i'll answer your question but i just want to make sure you're not going to schools because you're comfortable going to schools because they have pain you enjoy dealing with them um and that's who you want to serve like really that's it do they have pain lots of pain the more pain the better because if there's no pain, there's no sale, right? As businesses, we earn money by solving problems and making people's lives better. And if their life is already fine, like I don't do any work with people that come, you know, they wouldn't come to me and I wouldn't go to them. If I go to them, like, hey, want help with your cleaning company? No, I'm making all the money I ever wanted to make and I love my my company. What follow up? I none. Like they have no pain. What am I going to do? Like there's not, nothing there. So always start with the pain. People start with, I like them. I'm comfortable with them. I perceive them to have money. I did one before. I've got a friend that can get me an in. None of that matters if they don't have pain. And if they do have pain, all that matters a lot less because, you know, doctors are pretty easy sale. You come with a gunshot wound. Not a lot of questions about price or how he's going to do it or it just please make this stop mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. All right. Any question on that before we talk about how to specifically? Uh, no, I just to clarify, I, I understand. I understand the pain really well because we've cleaned enough and I also, uh, there's a ton of pain Perfect. enough to where when, when we come in, they, they, they would not, they would not rebid or switch. I know that's kind of objective, but, um, when, when you help out enough and they, they, they get time freed up, they're able to do other things that are higher level, kind of like what you teach us. Um, it's solving a huge pain for them. Love it. As long as they are aware of the pain, then that, that could be a great niche. And the fact that you're already comfortable with them, that's a bonus. I'm not saying it's a negative, it's a positive. It's just not the deciding factor, right? So great. If that's if that's all the case, I think that'd be a great niche. Um, and again, the only thing specific to schools, it can be a little funky with cash flow in the summer. Um, I always try and set them up where I do a bunch of floor work and other stuff. So the billing stays the same as an annual contract. Sometimes they'll do that, sometimes I, they won't. Um, if you can't do that, it really screws up your cash flow. If you can do it, it doesn't screw it screws up your cash flow less because the income stays the same, but your cost of goods sold gets a little funky. So you might be like, well, during the school year, it's you know 57%, but during the summer it's 22%. And it averages like if, 
<laughs> yeah. So again, yeah. is, is that a reason not to do them? No, of course not. But is it you yeah. just it's something you want to take into consideration? Um, and then also with hiring, it's like, all right, we got a great team of 26 people. And in the summer, we need 11. So again, mm -hmm. is that a deal breaker? Nope. Just something you want to yeah. Every niche has their pluses and minuses, and you're already familiar with that one. Okay. So the good news is the way the cool thing about the Dream 100 is pretty much the same for everybody. So I would get the list first if you don't have it. Um, clean the list because you can buy the list and half of them won't be any good or there'll be weird schools that you're not, you know what I'm saying? It might even be 20%. So you might want a list of 600 schools to get your dream 118, right? It's not going to be like, oh, I got my, I bought my list of 200. I'm good. It's like, eh, we'll see. Um, and as you're doing that, start building the marketing plan, which if I was going to do a dream 100 of schools, what would I do? I would definitely be on my favorite. And this is why niches are so important is to just go where they're already at and just be a part of that fabric. So I would be like, where do they go? Like, what are their associations? What are their unions? Where do they meet off when they're not at school? Like, you know, I don't know this because it's not my niche, but I know my kids every third day, like we got a teacher training. Everyone's off a raft day or some funky thing. Like where do they go when they're doing that? And I'm going to see if like, who buys food for that? How can I sponsor that? What do I need to, how can I bring value to that thing? Um, and I'm just going to go to where they, and same thing with car dealerships, same thing with property managers. They all have associations that, you know, teachers probably literally have a labor union that you could just be like, well, hold on, let me get in there. So I'm going to want to get to be where they're at. Cause that's, and I'm going to try and give as much value. Can I bring cookies? Can I be on the board? Can I be, you know, collect dues, whatever bull crest sweep up and like I'm the dude on the board. Cause then everybody knows you. Um, and again, specifically, I, sorry, I was talking about teachers, obviously you're going to want facilities managers, but they all congregate nicely somewhere, um, online, ideally in person. And that's always what I use as my foundation secondary. I'd probably do some sort of telemarketing campaign. Uh, probably wouldn't, yeah, I don't know if I only, it depends on how big my dream 100 is. I'd probably try and call everyone on that dream 100 two, three times a year. Personally, like if it was a thousand people on the list, I'm paying a telemarketer if they're just random people. But if it's 87 people and they're all worth six figures, lifetime value, I'm going to call all of myself two, three times. You know, I'm just going to knock out 10 a day or something, you know, some weird thing like that. Um, and then I'd have some sort of direct mail, lumpy mail one month and then postcards another. And then I'd probably round it out with some sort of monthly event where I invite them to lunch is a group of like eight to 12 people have two or three of my own clients, um, just there for fun. And, you know, they're always going to talk you up and then, uh, you know, six or seven of them in worst case, you just buy them lunch and have fun. Best case, you're going to have some sort of educational content or they don't care. They're just there for the food and the booze. If that's something that, you know, your culture would, <laughs> they, they, and your culture would allow. Um, but that would be how I would, break it up. I'd personally tell market and have some direct mail going out. I would, whatever their one of, you know, their one association was, I'd be there every time that gosh darn thing was open. And I would probably try and, uh, yeah, do a, a monthly event. And that would be the whole thing. And that alone, gosh, if you had a good dream 100 list, if that can't get you half a million dollars worth of recurring revenue every year, I don't know what will like that. That's a solid plan, dude. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Real quick, Cleaning Nation, if you can think about how you found out about this podcast, maybe a tweet, a Facebook message, iTunes search, some sort of Instagram post, the only way we grow is word of mouth. We don't do paid ads. We don't run ads. You are it. The only ask I have is if you're getting value, share the love. However you found out about this, if it's a review or a post, whatever it is, do that. Pay it forward so the next cleaning company owner can change their life as well. Back to the show. Brandon's happy. I'm happy. Let's uh, hook up with, where's my friend Capri? There she is. Hey, Capri. Good to see you. Hi. Question. Yeah. How yeah. I sell to my cleaners. I'm getting paid on the 5th and the 20th. Believe it or not, I wouldn't sell them anything. I would just say, okay. hey, here's how we're doing it. We don't like it. Oh. Like, okay. Okay. I've Not never had a job. No. Well, and again, I, I never had a job. I could almost finish saying this, but I haven't had a job for 30 years, but I worked at a car dealership as a salesperson in a Denny's. I think that was about it. <laughs> um, and they just told me when I got paid and I didn't really have any, like, I didn't think there was, there was a vote involved. <laughs> like, yeah, I no, no, so. no, no, no. I get paid every Friday and every third, three times on a full moon. And they just said, here's payday. And I guess I could have been like, well, I don't like it. And they'd have been like, all right. <laughs> like, I, I don't yeah. know that that would have had any impact on their business I model. I know they like it on Fridays, but because it's sure going to change with the fifth and the 20th. 
um, then it's going to be different days every month for me personally. Because, like, right now I'll do the payroll on Monday. Like, every Monday I just know I'm... Um, so, two collecting. things. One, you should not be doing any of this. Your accountant, oh, okay. your accountant should be translating your employees' hours to your payroll company. So, okay. you're not Capri. Second... You would, yeah, it would be the 15th and the 20th, so the day would switch, but yeah, that's in a grown-up accountant can do that. And third, I want to encourage you, 80% of the reason we do the payroll the way that we do is logistically, internally for you. Um, Your cost of good soul will never be right if you're doing payroll weekly because you're always going to have payrolls and the wrong thing and it's all in rear, the whole thing's screwed up. So half of it's for that. Another 20 or 30% is just from a logistical standpoint, if you're doing payroll weekly and you're personally doing it, I'll bet you that's, gosh, you might be spending 50, no, 60, I'm 70 hours a year. No, I'm not doing the payroll. I don't mean processing the payroll. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. Okay. Preparing okay. the payroll. That's as much yeah. work. So there's two parts, guys and gals, to do in the payroll. There's taking the timesheet, whatever format that is, and putting it into the payroll company. That's not only an hour or two a week. That's the most frustrating least. You know what I'm saying? Like, I can't think of a thing I would enjoy doing less. It's not like it's fun. Um, and then the second half is once mm. the payroll company does what they need to do with 941s, 945s, takes all the payroll taxes, yada, yada, and they pull out that 12,000 bucks or whatever it is, somebody has to enter that and translate that back to QuickBooks. Like, hey, that 12 grand, here's how it breaks up, you know, cost of goods sold, payroll tax, and your accountant should be doing both of those. So your payroll company does the middle, right? Your accountant translates your, okay. pay, your hours to the payroll company's format, the payroll company processes it and handles all the, the the deductions and pulls the money out of your account. And then your accountant yeah. translates that raw, hey, this $12,000 came out. Where did, how do I break that up? You should be doing none of it. Your accountant should do the outside pieces. Your payroll company should do the middle. And your involvement is once a month, as long as everything's generally green, going over your own profit and loss and looking at your cost of goods sold. When things get yellow or your cost of goods sold is wonky, you would go over it twice a month after every payroll. So your job is to look at it and if your cost of goods sold is really funky, you might go over it before payroll. Like, hey, before you run payroll, I want to see it. And I would still have my accountant prepare all that for me. So none of it would be Capri preparing it. It's just Capri reviewing the data. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So when I when I gather the timesheets to give, like I'm not supposed to do that anymore. At the same time, I do the mileage and give it to the payroll. Yeah, they can do the all The accountant. Of yeah, the accountant should you just oh. tell the accountant how pay how mileage is paid and they just handle it. So they would just have to have access to the schedule. Because I have been doing the average six miles between houses to make it so I'm not um I used just, to map quest everybody's Yeah, I wouldn't do you can't route. I wouldn't. Mm-hmm. Um Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, depending on how you collect that data, you'll have, it, you'll have to decide what the account needs access to. But no, if, for me, my account has all my QuickBooks, all my bank information. So there's nothing I really am like, you can't have access to this. It's yeah. like, just like, about, oh. it, you know, if I'm going to rob you, I'm going to rob you. So I, yeah, I would give her access to whatever he or she needs. I think my scheduler, or would that be wrong to have my scheduler do um, the mileage? Cause she kind of wants a little bit more to do right now. I wouldn't or, say it'd be wrong, but I just, okay. Not her department. The, the well, what's going to happen? What I shouldn't say is going to happen. What you run the risk of is when something gets funky, the scheduler is like, "Oh, the accountant screwed it up," and the accountant's going to complain the scheduler. But if if Vernetta's just the accountant and just does the whole thing, it's hard for Vernetta to be like, "Well, Brandon didn't do, and I don't oh. like blah blah blah." So I just I don't want to get into. It. It's just why make things more complex oh. when it don't have to be. I just like the schedulers right there with the schedule and could just like see them. You can test it. It's so the the, the non-negotiable is Capri not doing it. That's important. Okay. I didn't even think about that. So someone qualified doing it. Yeah. That's not you. That's the key to the whole operation. I would just have a do. I do it at my accountant, but if I can, the schedule, yeah, do it. And if she does a good job and there's no fights and you like it, great. Okay. But the non-negotiable is not Capri. That's, that's the takeaway. That's the scene. That's Uh. the, the thesis of this whole conversation. Um, okay. okay. So to answer your question on the fifth and twentieth, you don't sell it. You just tell them this is how we're doing. Payroll. Okay. Okay. I'm going to do that. Oh, so what I was saying is half the benefit is your cost of goods sold will be right. 30% of the benefit is um, you just save a ton of time and money, some your money and someone else's time. Because um, instead of doing 52 payrolls a month or a oh. year, 
And, you know, if a payroll takes an hour or two and the most frustrating hour or two of your week, and that goes down to 24 payrolls, that's less than half. Mm -hmm. And then, so that is huge. And then three, the people that freak out about, I yeah, I got to get that 287 bucks on Friday or I'm going to be homeless. Okay. That's, that's a, you know, first date. Hey, can you pick me up? I don't have a car. I got it taken away for, you know, drinking and driving. You're like, oh, I don't mind. He's on the way. I'm like, it's not about being on the way. It's about the dude doesn't, <laughs> you know, it's not about the, why can't you, why can't you get paid every other? Cause I need that money. Okay. So you're that tight where you have no whatever, like, which is fine. And not only am I so tight, I'm willing to tell my boss what time it is. Like, Hey, I need to get paid. You know, I'd rather get daily. Like, yeah, I'm sure you're, you're half homeless, <laughs> which is fine. We're not judging them, but that's just not who I want in my organization. Yeah. Yeah. Most of okay. our people we pay monthly, like just cause it's easy. Wow. Yeah. And again, okay. they're, but they're higher caliber people. They don't, they're not like, I need my money. I'm going to starve. Yeah. I do think they might ask about mileage because right now they get their mileage reimbursement once a week. So yeah, they just, just have to adjust to twice a week. I mean, twice a month. Yeah. And again, obviously make sure you're following the, the laws of your land, right? If the law says you have to pay mileage or anything more frequently than do that. Um, I think there's one or two states that you have to pay weekly. I think it's like New Jersey or know, some super government intensive okay. state. So you would probably know. And again, check with your payroll company. Hey, this is what I'd like to do. That is that legal in my state? I'm 90% sure it is, but it's worth checking. Same with the mileage. Okay. And if you're doing it by the law, again, they don't really get a vote on like, you're not, I get it. If you're like, Hey, you do the work, I'll pay in three months, but every other week or twice a month is kind of how the most of the world works. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Good. Well, here we are the end of the podcast and you made it great job. Uh, I've got a little bonus for you before for sticking through with me, but like I mentioned before, if you got value out of this podcast and you want to show a little love, subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes, Spotify, wherever the heck you're listening to this thing, share with a friend, share the love. And as a special thank you for those of you that stuck with me to the end, how about I give you my personal phone number so we can text? It's a great way for me to get to know you, your business, your goals personally. So shoot me a text now, 602-932-6431. That's 602-932-6431. I am the only one who responds to these texts and I will personally respond to everyone I possibly can as long as uh, this number is manned. I uh, don't know how long we're going to keep this at the end of the podcast, so grab it now. 602-932-6431. Give me a text. Say hey. Can't wait to meet you.